Hey there, YouTube. Farter Off Racing here. We've been writing technical articles on how to make race cars go fast for almost 20 years. We started off on mailing lists and moved to forums and started our own website, wrote out autocross to win, and we've been tracking the, the progress of the Far North Racing Stealth as it gets transformed from a rescue dog into something you want to drive around the street. And it's something I've learned in the last little while is that the kids today, they don't want to see static web pages anymore. They don't want to read stuff. They want to see moving pictures. They want videos. Well, we're nothing if not adaptable. So we've gone ahead and got ourselves a camera. We're here in the shop today, and we're gonna do some of the things that we've been working on the Stealth uh, as a video, so we can show you uh, what it is we're up to. Today, we're gonna talk about fuel injectors. We're gonna talk about why they're important. We're gonna talk about sizing them, and we're gonna talk about how to transform injectors from one kind to another if you need to adapt to new technology. So a fuel injector, is how a electronically controlled fuel injected car controls how much gasoline goes into the engine. It's an electromagnetic solenoid uh, in here, pointer. Inside the body are some electrical windings. Here is the electrical connection that comes in there. A one end goes to positive 12 volts, the other end goes to the computer. When the computer wants to turn this thing on, it pulls one of them to ground, that completes the circuit through here and opens up the pintle. When the pintle is open, fuel comes in here. It's pressurized to about 40 PSI from the fuel pump that's in the gas tank. Fuel comes up through here, it squirts out of the nozzle here. When the computer has decided that it's the time to stop fueling, it brings the connection back up from ground, breaks the connection. A spring inside the body of the injector closes the pintle, and that shuts off the flow of fuel and the fueling stops. Much, much better than the old style carburetor, which relied on differential pressure based on the amount of airflow going to the engine to control your fueling. This thing here is under direct computer control, so the computer can turn on fuel and turn off fuel whenever it wants, and it can use all kinds of inputs and controls to figure out when it needs to be able to turn the fuel on and off. If you're an old guy like me, and you started off on a carbureted cars, either with a Holly 4130 double pumper or a Quadrajet, a Cubog, you know about all the various mechanical contrivances and linkages that were on that thing so that it would work not only under full power and full load, but so that it would idle properly, so that it worked at par throttle, so that emissions were reasonable and all the rest of that sort of thing. This thing doesn't suffer from any of those problems because the computer has access to sensors all over the engine that can measure airflow, can measure coolant temperature, can measure air temperature, can measure all this stuff, and then it can control the amount of fueling going into the engine directly. This is the way to do it. Fuel injection is so much better than carburation. This technology is now getting near on uh, 25 years old. Electronic fuel injection first started to show its head in, in the late 80s. It really came into its own in the 90s and it's been going hard ever since. And with the Stealth being in 1993, it's a slightly older technology that now needs to be brought forward to solve a few problems we've got. So what we've got going on here, this is what's called a low impedance injector. Low impedance because the resistance of the coil that's in here is low compared to a high impedance injector. The difference in them is not so much the impedance inside the, the, the solenoid itself, although that, that is there. The difference is about the control strategy. So there were two control strategies to work with injectors. The basic one, which is called a saturated injector or a high impedance injector, is a very simple on-off circuit. Computer pulls the thing to ground, solenoid comes on, fuel squirts in. But the technology of the time, both in terms of the, the mechanical technology inside the injector and the technology inside the computer, was such that a high impedance injector was not particularly responsive. It was slow to open, it was slow to close. That's okay in an economy car that doesn't require a whole lot of fueling and use a small injector. And so you can, you've got some fudge factor given that the amount of fuel coming out per millisecond of on time isn't all that large. But when you went into high performance applications, that wasn't good enough. A low impedance injector has a whole lot more windings in here and uses a lighter pintle inside. And it was designed for a two stage control strategy whereby you gave an initial high shot of current to yank the thing open and get it moving. And then you would back down the current to hold it open while it was continuing to squirt. That's called a peak and hold injector. Peak because of the initial shot and then hold because you're holding it open. You couldn't maintain the high current to the thing all the way through because that high current gets really hot in here and the thing overheats and burns up. So if you wanted a high performance car, you had a low impedance injector, peak and hold. 
if you had a regular sort of economy car, you had an uh, on-off uh, saturation injector. For specifically some of the Mitsubishi cars, some of the Toyota cars, the performance cars in the 90s, they wanted to use high impedance because it's cheaper. With a high impedance injector, the circuit inside the computer is much simpler because all you have to do is turn the thing on, turn the thing off. The extra circuitry required to run a peak and hold adds cost as well as the, the injectors themselves adding cost to it. What they found though with high performance, low displacement turbo cars like the Mitsubishi Eclipse, like the Evo, like the Toyota Supra, like the 3000 GT and the Stealth, was that they couldn't get the performance they wanted out of a high impedance injector. But they didn't want to go to the cost and complexity of using a low impedance peak and hold. So what they did is they used a low impedance injector which has a higher performance mechanical bits inside with a high impedance circuit. And that the improvements in the extra power that comes from the extra windings inside the body of the injector and a lighter pintle inside of it got them enough extra performance to deliver the, the fueling they wanted while still retaining the high impedance simple use circuitry inside the computer. That's great for the 1990s, but the technology has since moved on. If you need to use a bigger injector because you're running bigger turbos, you've got a freer flowing exhaust, uh, you've done anything that's bringing really more boost on the turbos, for example, you need a larger injector, you no longer need to go ahead and use a 1990s technology. Instead, what we've got is this bad boy. This little piece of sexiness is a Bosch Motorsports high impedance injector that's been modified by a company called Injector Dynamics to provide a little bit more flow. This here is a fraction of the size and weight of this one over here, but it flows way more. This is a 725 cc per minute injector. This one over here is a 425 cc per minute injector. This one flows almost twice as much as this one. This one uses a high impedance circuit. So you can go ahead and use a simple control strategy with it. And most amazingly, because the internals on this thing are so light, because the performance of this thing is so good, this injector can control very, very, very short opening times much more accurately than this one can. So you no longer need to make that choice between wide open power, high flow injector, and control for startup, warm up, idle, part throttle, transitional throttle that you used to do. Now you can have your cake and eat it too. The only downside to this thing, aside from the astronomical cost, this thing costs about four times as much as this, is they went and they changed the electrical connection on us. Now we used to have a bog standard connector like this that every injector in the 90s used. They've gone and changed it on us and moved it to this connector here. So to put this thing in our engine, even though mechanically they're the same, they both fit in the same space, let me make sure you can see that. They both fit in the same space. We have to change the electrical connection on the harness to match what this thing wants to connect to. So what we're going to do here is just going to demonstrate the difference between a low impedance injector and a high impedance injector on the old uh, Radio Shack digital multimeter. Yeah, it's yellow but it looks like a fluke, but it's not a fluke. But this is from the days when Radio Shack actually meant something and they actually made some decent equipment. We'll just go ahead and put this on the old ohmmeter. There she goes. So about two and a half ohms. We'll do the same thing to the injector dynamics. And there you can see it's about 12 ohms. So that's the difference we're talking about, low impedance and high impedance. Our first order of business is to convert the OEM wiring harness with its old style injector connectors to a new harness that has the new style connectors that the new injectors want to use. This is a OEM wire harness from the Stealth. You can see here it's got a connector here for a daughter harness, and here it's got the three connectors uh, for the other injectors. You can see that it's been put together with electrical tape wrapped around the uh, wire here. We've got an 18 gauge automotive wire 
Each wire is individually color coded for what connector it's going to. And it goes back to one of these sealed connectors here. It's got this nice uh, silicone donut on each one of these things to seal it off so it's to a certain degree water, water resistant and, and crud resistant and generally doesn't let shit get into it. So we need to take this thing and we need to recreate it with new connectors to fit here for the new injectors. The way we're going to do that is we're going to use some newer technology. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to use this wire here. This is called a Tetzfel wire. This is aircraft wire. It's also used in high-end race cars, Formula One, things like that. The magic behind Tetzfel is first that it's got a very, very thin but extremely strong insulation on it. The thickness of the insulation on this is maybe a third of what a standard automotive wire is. Uh, it still comes in a bunch of different colors. You can get it so you can, you can maintain the color code that the OEM had. Uh, the stripe wraps around as opposed to going straight down the side, but that's all right. This insulation is abrasive resistant. It's cross-linked uh, Teflon construction, uh, so it's slippery. And it basically just lasts a whole lot longer, it doesn't decay, doesn't crack, doesn't do any of that sort of stuff. Because it's thinner, it means you can pack more wire into a similar space because you've now got less insulation in between each individual wire bundle. But that's not all. So here we've got a section stripped off. You'll notice that the wire looks silver. And the reason why that is, is that although this is copper wire, multi-strand copper wire, each wire is individually tinned. This here prevents the copper from corroding. So if any moisture manages to wick its way down this wire, each individual strand is uh, protected by the tinning, which makes it this wire extremely corrosion resistant. Uh, this stuff is just the cat's ass. A wiring harness made out of this stuff is smaller, it's lighter, it still carries the same amount of current as the, a wire of equivalent size, but it's way more corrosion resistant because the wiring itself is individually tinned. It's not that much more expensive than regular wire. It is a little more pricey, but it's not ridiculously pricey. The biggest problem with this is that it is a pain in the ass to strip. It requires its own proprietary stripper. So let me just get that. So as I mentioned before, the insulation on that Tetzfel wire is very, very slippery and it's very, very thin. It's very difficult to strip it using a standard hardware store kind of wire stripper. It takes a proprietary stripper to be able to cut it properly, and this is what it looks like. It's designed so that it's got a jaw that comes down. You can see that opening and closing there. And you'll notice it's got little dimples in there that are precisely sized to cut the insulation on that particular kind of wire. So this stripper is designed to cut Tetzfall wire and only Tetzfall wire. What you do is you take your wire, you bring it into the jaw, you put it in on the setting that's designed for the wire gauge that you've got there, center it in the jaw there, give it a quick squeeze, and you'll see that strip is absolutely perfect. It doesn't disturb the wire bundle at all, there's no spraying, there's no splaying, it doesn't nick the wire. Every single strip is perfect every single time. It's an amazing tool. It's even set up. So the jaw that comes down and does the grabbing part, so this part right here, you'll see where it comes down and it grabs the wire like that. That's not serrated. The inside surface of these jaws is actually covered with an abrasive like sandpaper. So it can grab the wire firmly to be able to pull it apart, but it doesn't nick the insulation. And you use this stripper and every single time you move the strip, it comes out perfectly. The downside to this tool is the cost. Like everything else, mill spec, race spec, air aircraft, this is a $300 wire stripper. Happily, I was able to get it on eBay for about a third of that. But when you're doing these sorts of things, it's not just the cost of the materials you're using, it's also the cost of the tooling. A beautiful tool, works great, but dear God, this stuff's expensive. So what we went ahead and did was built the daughter harness that we needed to do in order to be able to fit those injectors. Uh, we've got here the connectors, that injector dynamics supply that fits the Bosch injector. We've got it wrapped in the Raychem DR25 heat shrink. You can go ahead and take this injector and we slap it on there. 
nice positive click, and she's on. Um, when it comes off, just a, a nice action on that. Uh, nice and waterproof. The other thing we've got going on here, if you look very carefully, are these super sexy Raychem molded transitions. This wiring harness needs to break out each one of these uh, injector connectors on here. You want to be able to have that transition be strain relieved and be protected against the environment. And these molded boots, that's what does it. Uh, these things are heat shrink as well. When they show up, they look like a little piece of tape. Uh, it looks nothing like what it looks like now. You slide it on the harness, you hit it with your heat gun, and it molds itself to this shape. Grabs a hole of the wire and, and, and doesn't let go. So now you've got environmental sealing and strain relief on there, and it's nice and sexy. And the downside to these things is, again, like anything else, spec, cost. Each one of these things is 23 Canadian dollars before shipping and taxes. It doesn't take long if you're doing a, a wiring harness with a lot of breakouts for the cost on these things to add up and push the cost of your harness from being just expensive to ludicrous. You can get transitions to seal the ends of these connectors as well. I didn't bother, uh, mostly because these connectors have built-in environmental sealing here. You'll see this green, that's the rubber uh, seal that fits on the back of that. So I figured that that was good enough, and I'm not too worried about moisture getting into the ends of this uh, because it's all sealed up in here. So that there gives us our harness. And on the other end, that uses the OEM style connector, the same as the, the other harness does. In fact, if I go and bring them over and compare them, you can see it's the same thing. Uh, the difference is, is, of course, this has been crimped on. And the same way as the last one, it's got these environmental seals on here to keep this thing all sealed off. That gives us the wiring harness for the back bank of cylinders for our project here. So that harness got us our backpack of cylinders. We now have to worry about the front back of cylinders because the cell is a V6. Here we go. Here's our new harness. This one here, though, is different than the other one in that this harness was wired into the main wiring harness for the engine. So whereas the other one had a daughter harness just unplugged, this one here we had to slice into the original harness and put an intermediate connector to be able to break this out as a separate piece. On this end, we have the connectors, the OEM style connectors for the uh, cam angle sensor and the crank angle sensor. We've got ourselves a ray cam transition there. There's our three injector connectors. And on this end, we've got a Deutsch DT connector that's been spliced in to attach to the main wiring harness. The female end of this is on the car. Uh, this one here has been attached onto the, onto the harness here. This one here is also weather sealed much like the OEM ones. Here it's not an individual seal, it's a, it's a giant block seal that these things push into. This Deutsch DT series and their DTM series are a mid-level motorsports slash industrial connector. They're weather sealed, they're extremely well crimped, and we'll get to that in a second, and uh, they have a, a really good capacity. And you can see here on the end, that's what it looks like as it goes in. Each one of those pins is a socket, and there's a matching one on the car that, that clicks into that. Uh, the one mistake that I made is that uh, when I was ordering this, uh, I didn't pick up the difference between DT and DTM. A DT is the slightly larger connector normally used on industrial uh, applications like uh, mining equipment. The DTM, the miniature version, is what's normally used on uh, race cars. Uh, the difference is this. That's a DTM end. That's the DT end. Uh, you can see that's where, the way it goes around. So it's slightly smaller and it's black. Uh, it doesn't really change things all that much. Uh, this one is rated to 7.5 amps. This one here is rated to 10 amps. Uh, slightly smaller end on it, so it's a little more compact. Uh, all things considered, doesn't really matter. The uh, brilliance of these connectors is their ease of assembly and the crimp that these things go in. And much like our wire strippers were in the, in the, uh, the test full wire, the problem here is not the cost of the connector. That connector is about $25. The problem here is the cost of the tooling. This is a Deutsch terminal crimper. It ratchets open, ratchets closed, and you'll see right inside of here, these four little jaws that come down and crimp that thing around there. This is designed so that the plug drops directly into this hole. You stick the wire in, you go, and it's crimped. And that crimp is absolutely perfect. 
On this end, you have the ability to, to adjust the depth of how long it sits in that, in that turret. And this in here is, a, is an adjuster that sets how far that goes, depending on what wire diameter you're using. Uh, this gives you an OEM style crimp that is perfect every single time, and it only takes a matter of seconds to make. Problem again, this is a $600 crimper that again, I got on eBay for about one sixth of that because somebody had one used he wasn't using anymore. Uh, these DTM and, and DT connectors are just fabulous. They're a, a much better alternative than using the Deutsch Motorsports connectors, which run $50 to $250 per connector. Uh, this gets you, the, the Deutsch connector gets you the weather sealing and, and the number of cycles and so on that you need to use uh, at a reasonable price. But again, tooling can be a murder unless you, you go to the, the eBay and find yourself a, a used one to use. While we're on the subject of crimpers, this here is the Delphi crimper that's used to do the OEM style uh, terminals. Much like the other one, it's got a ratchet mechanism. You just click it, in, clicks it open like that. So when you do the terminal, it clicks down and then opens up. So it sets the depth every single time. And this is designed with the jaws in here. There's a part that crimps the outer barrel of the, of the terminal. This part in here crimps the part that goes down the wire. So you just insert the thing in there, get the depth set right, crimp it, squeeze it, it pops open, and there's your crimp. Every one of them the same. Uh, this crimper here, a little cheaper than the Deutsch one. Now this one here was only uh, about 150, and this one I couldn't find on eBay, so I wound up playing full price uh, from Delphi. Getting the right tooling for building your wiring harnesses makes an enormous difference. The terminals are perfect every time. You don't spend a whole lot of time chasing yourself. And you can imagine, when I was fabricating this, every wire has got to be measured. Can you imagine getting into, into this part in here and, and screwing up one of the crimps on the terminal, and, and now that wire is no good after it's been sealed in and all the rest of it? The investment in the tooling is worthwhile if you're going to be building any number of wiring harnesses because it lets you do it right the first time and you don't have to worry about improperly crimped uh, connections or bad seals or anything like that. So that's the way you do this. But we're not quite done. We mentioned earlier that uh, the stock injector was a low impedance and the new injector is a high impedance. And the way that Mitsubishi did that was they took a low impedance injector and put it in series with a resistor. So this is a resistor pack. Inside this connection, there's seven wires. One of the wires, this one here, is plus 12 volts to the battery. Every one of these ones goes out to one of the six injectors, and it runs it all through this resistor pack. So this resistor, in series with this, looks to the computer like a high impedance injector. If you use a high impedance injector though, this one here, and you keep it in series with the resistor pack, you've now got a very high impedance injector and that won't work. So we need to get rid of this. We need to replace this thing with something that just ties all these wires together directly to 12 volts but and doesn't have this resistor pack there anymore. So all you need to do to do that is you get the male version of this plug, you wire it in, you crimp all the, tip, the, the, the pins in place, and then you just tie all these wires together uh, so that the, now it's just running to each other. That, though, gives you this ugly looking pigtail that's hanging off the back of the connector. And we can't have ugly, this is, this is a sports car, this is a race car. So how do we fix that? Well, we do it with this. This black piece here is our OEM connector. There it is, there's our pins, there's all that stuff in there. But what we've gone and done is designed this back shell out of plastic. This was designed in SolidWorks. This was then sent to a company called Shapeways.com and they print this thing out using their 3D printer. And a couple of days later, it shows up in the mail and I now have a plastic part. This is the future. Uh, I, I just, I can't believe this. When I first started doing racing in cars uh, 20 years ago, we had nothing like this. 
if I wanted to build something that was plastic, I would, I would either have to carve it out of a solid block of plastic myself, which is ludicrous, or I'd have to have it taken to somebody who would design an injection mold to build this part. And although the unit price per part would be a couple of pennies, the price of building the mold and getting it on somebody's time and, and doing all that sort of stuff would be thousands of dollars, which just wouldn't make it worth it. Injected molding is great if you're gonna make thousands of parts and you're gonna sell these things. Uh, the market for a uh, resistor pack eliminator back shell in the world is probably five people. So there's no way you can do that. Uh, now you go ahead, you do it with a 3D printer, it shows up in the mail, and these guys, this part is now for sale on shapeways.com. If you want to do one of these things, you just go there, you look for this part, uh, you, you pay the, the 40 bucks it costs to get it uh, made, they send it to you, and I get a cut of it because I designed the thing. Uh, this is just, it blows me away that this is possible. Uh, that you can sit down at your computer, design a part in SolidWorks, send it off to somebody, and a few days later you get the thing made back in plastic. Can't make it out of aluminum like it normally would because it can't be conductive. You've got wires in here that although they're wrapped inside heat shrink and I've got them protected, you don't want to have it rattling around in there and, and chafing and maybe shorting itself against the back shell. Uh, this being a, an insulator, it's now in there and it looks just so sexy. Uh, I mean, compare that to there, so that compares pretty nicely. And then I went ahead and made a, a uh, aluminum plate for this to bolt to just like that, so that bolts up against the firewall and it occupies the same space that that did. So with all those parts in place, we now have a wiring harness, we've got our new injector, we've got our resistor pack eliminator, we can go ahead and mount all those three things to the car and that will allow us to transfer from the old style 1990s low impedance, lower flow injector to a modern 2016 style high flow, high impedance injector with all the ability to control fuel flow at the low end and allow us to have our cake and eat it too. Uh, this injector will support well over 550 horsepower. I'm not going to get that high. I'm, I'm aiming for about 400. But this here should allow me to make the power that I want and still keep idle quality the same keep drivability good, part throttle, start up warm up. Part of what makes this work is the fact that I have an aftermarket computer in the car. I can reprogram it so I can tell it that I've got larger injectors that I can go through afterwards and tune it to make sure that it's all uh, set up uh, accordingly. You can't just slap these things in on an OEM computer and hope for it to work. Uh, that's the other part of the equation. But what I'm going to do next is I'm going to reassemble the car and uh, I got a couple other projects on the go so I won't be able to do it as part of this video. But that will transform us over to this nice new technology and get us to the point where I can get rid of some of the problems that I've been having with these, these old injectors. So here I just want to show you some of the surprises you can find when you start working on these cars. Uh, this is the part of the OEM wiring harness that went to the cam angle sensor. And this line right here, you look right there, she's all frayed and split. Just like that, there's only a couple of strands of copper holding that on there. Uh, I don't know how many of the problems I've been having with this motor are related to the fact that that wire was all chewed up inside that harness. It was wrapped in electrical tape, you'd never see it. But now uh, you can see that uh, things can only get better now that that wiring harness has been replaced. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.